All right, Philippians chapter three. Let's go ahead and read. We'll read a few verses here before we begin and then we'll pray. It says in verse one, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we lift up this evening to you, Lord. And God, we want to lift up, first off, the missions conference that is going on right now in Marietta as we speak, as they are probably sitting before uh, a teacher right now, a pastor, maybe a missionary that has come back to just share their testimony and what they have been through recently. Uh, Lord, we ask, Father, that you would just be with that group that is there, Marietta, Father. Lord, we ask for a refreshing spirit upon them. Those that are just broken down, Lord. Those that are tired, those that have come back. And uh, Lord, even some that are questioning whether or not they should even go back into the mission field, Father. God, those that are just completely worn out and tired. God, we lift them up to you now, Father. And we ask, Lord, that you would just restore their spirit, God that you would encourage them. Father, that you would just provide for their needs, God, whether it be financially or spiritually, Lord, whether it be with a friend to come in and just encourage them with scripture and to give them uh, just that word of encouragement that they definitely need. We ask, Father, for just fresh vision, Lord, as well upon all of those that are there, uh, my parents especially, as they will be coming back we pray that they would come back with just some sort of vision or insight, God, and uh, Lord, that you would minister to them now and that as they come back, we would just rejoice with them as to what you want to do in the near future. God, we just uh, thank you for this evening as we as well as believers, we get to just gather here all the way across town and we get to get into your word just the same, Father. We ask that you would just open it up to us now Father, that you would allow us just to learn from the truths that are found here in your word. That God, these truths would be so much more than anything else we get out there in this world, Lord. That it would be so valuable to us and that we would rejoice, God, in all these things. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 1, and uh, I usually encourage you guys, and I'll do so again this evening, to, uh, if you'd like to go along with me in the book of Philippians, you can do so online. Chapters 1 and 2 are, uh, should be up already there on the website, and it is neat to grab a book and to just go through it and to just learn from all of the truths, and um, there is a lot of really good background and insight to the book of Philippians there. Uh, you guys know already, if you've been with me in the last couple of chapters, that the book of Philippians was uh, written by Paul to the church there in Philippi, and he just had such a great love for them, right? A friendship for them, and, uh, and he just loved everything that they were about. He was there with them in the very beginning as they started their ministry, and now years later, he gets to write back to the Philippians and encourage them where they're at, and it's such a contrast from what we find with the book of Corinthians, uh, with the book of Colossians. You know, a lot of these books where they're struggling and dealing with some things that Paul has to write, uh, you know, in regards to correction maybe more so. Uh, the book of Philippians, Paul just gives complete encouragement and love. And uh, it's just such a neat book. I'm just, I, I just love it and studying through it. And it really is just a joyful book. So if you need to be encouraged this evening and to just rejoice in the Lord and and 
grab a hold of his joy, I would encourage you, go back and start to read again the book of Philippians. But let's read again in verse one here in chapter three this evening. It says this, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul begins chapter three here with one word and that word is finally, right? Finally. It kind of reminds me as Paul uses that word finally of that pastor that uses that phrase now in closing, right? You guys ever sit there with a pastor and go now in closing and then they go on for another half hour, you know, and you're just like, oh, I thought they were closing 20 minutes, you know, and that's kind of what Paul's doing here. He says, finally, you know, in his letter to the Philippians, and really he's only halfway through his book, right? There's four chapters and we're on just at the very beginning of chapter three. And Paul, uh, he says, finally here, but he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And if you're going to underline in your Bible or highlight, uh, I always, as I usually do, just kind of point out the areas that I highlight and underline. I, I highlighted that in my Bible, rejoice in the Lord, because that's what really this chapter is all about. It is just about rejoicing in God and what he has for us. He says, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. You know, Paul has encouraged so far the Philippians in a couple different things. And that's why really he says the word finally, not necessarily because he's closing, but because he's now coming to another point. And the first thing that he kind of encouraged them in was to live as Christ to live as Christ in unity. There in chapter one, he encouraged them with about the unity found in Jesus, or in chapter two, I should say at the beginning, to be encouraged in unity through humility, uh, which is a second point, to be humble. To be humble, he encouraged them. And now we see a third point that Paul brings to the church there in Philippi, and that is to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord. You can never be encouraged too much, right, or enough to rejoice in the Lord. You know, so many things in life, it's difficult, you know, to find reasons to rejoice in. You know, it's like, man, there's so many things going on, so many things we need prayer for, you know, so many things with the family or with our jobs or just with, you know, just you name it. And it's just so difficult to find things to rejoice. But yet Paul here says what? He says, rejoice in the Lord, Rejoice in the Lord. That's a neat thing is that we can always find reasons to rejoice in the Lord, right? There's never, you know, there's never a, a time where we come before the Lord and consider his goodness and consider just how great he is and how good he is to us and, and can't find a reason to rejoice for it. You know, there's always that reason. The common theme that is running throughout the book of Philippians, as I said in the very beginning in chapter one, is joy, it is joy. That's what Paul continues to speak to them about. Again, a church that, you know, for the most part, kind of sort of has it all together. They're doing very, very well. Paul encourages them in that. Be joyful. Rejoice. He says that uh, uh, the word joy or the topic of joy 16 times in this little book, in four chapters, 16 times he alludes to joy or rejoicing. Paul felt that it was just extremely important for this church to hold on to that joy that they find in Christ as it is so for us, just to keep it the focus. You know, do you think it would have been tedious for Paul maybe after the 10th time there, writing about joy? You know, number 11, 12, 13, 14 times, you know, he writes it, or even for the, the church there in Philippi as they were reading it, you know, the fifth, sixth, seventh time. Okay, Paul, we get it. Rejoice. We get it. Be joyful. You know, let's flip a couple pages and get to the end of the letter here, maybe. You know, what else does he have for us? Paul says, hey, it's not tedious for me. It never gets old to continue to just encourage you guys. He just falls back on it, you know, and I don't know about you guys, but I just get so blessed by the men in my life that have encouraged me over the years. You know, even this evening as I'm worshiping, the Lord is just like totally ministering to me. You know, for some reason, he just put it on my heart to text, you know, one of my old pastors and just tell them, hey, thank you so much for all the times you poured into me. Thank you so much for all the opportunities you gave me 
for stretching me, for challenging me. You know, I just said, you know, and uh, you don't want to, you know, oh, maybe, uh, you know, you kind of don't want, and I just, you know what, Lord, I just need to be faithful and just do it. So I just sent him more, you know, God bless you, man, and I'm just thinking about you. And, you know, and we just have to be so thankful and joyful for those times in the Lord. That's what, that I could see the relationship there between the church in Philippi and also Paul. It wasn't tedious for him. And for them, Paul said it was safe. It was safe for them to continually be reminded of that. Rejoice in the Lord, to keep that joy as our main characteristic. To keep that joy as the main thing in our lives. He he says this, he says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He says, don't even look to the flesh. Get the flesh out of your mind. Get works out of your mind. Get the concept of righteousness by works out of your mind. That's what basically he is telling them here. He says, simply rejoice in Christ. Rejoice in what God has done. Rejoice in the work that Jesus has done. What does that mean? It means that Jesus paid it all, right? Jesus paid it all. And that's something to be joyful about. That we don't have to worry about the mutilation of the body. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Praise the Lord. If that's not something to rejoice in, right? We don't have to worry about beating the body, beating ourselves. We don't have to worry about striving and working for salvation, We get to just sit back and enjoy the fact that Jesus paid it all, that he already did all the work on the cross. What does that mean? It means that any time we come up to anything in our lives that we are struggling with, any type of sin, anything that that creates a debt within us to the Lord, that it's already been paid for. It doesn't mean that when you, you you go to a restaurant, you eat a nice steak, the waitress brings you the bill, you don't go, oh, Jesus paid it all. That's not what it means. You know, we can't take advantage of it. But it means that in all of the works that are required for salvation and the perf- really the perfection, I should say, that is required, that it's already been taken care of. Rejoice in Christ Jesus, Paul said. Have no confidence in the flesh. I love that. Verse four says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. So if anyone could have confidence in the flesh, Paul is saying it was him, right? He says there in verse four, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, uh, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Paul was the perfect person to bring the gospel of grace to the world. If anyone should do it, it should have been Paul. Because this guy, in his own works, in his own might, he had everything. He had everything all sorted out. He had everything together. And yet still in the end, it was not good enough. And if anyone could say so, it was Paul. And you could have the same mindset. You know, well, I just need to work a little bit harder at it. I just need to try a little harder next time. I just need to cut certain things out of my life. Man, if I could just overcome that one thing. But the truth is, is that it will really never end, right? We'll never be good enough. We'll never cut enough out of our lives. We'll never get over Everything. Why? Because we get over one little hump and guess what? Another speed bump right around the corner. And like Paul, we can strive and strive and strive perf- to, for perfection. But in the end, we'll all come to the same conclusion as Paul did. It's not good enough. No matter what I did, no matter who I was, no matter what life or family I was born into. Verse seven says this. It says, but what things were gained to me These I have counted loss for Christ. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Being born in America, we're always taught that in the end, the person with the most toys wins, right? It's all about who can obtain, 
you know, who can gain the most, the most material, the most, most wealth. We get a bonus and what do we want to do? We want to spend it right away, right? It burns a hole in our pocket. You know, we get a raise and we want to upgrade the car, you know, or, or fix up the house, remodel. You know, the goal is to get so much of a return back on our 401k. You know, we're always striving, you know. The problem is, is where is the Lord in all of that? Where is Christ in all of these things that we're taught? You know, a lot of times he ends up taking a back seat to our lives, right? He ends up taking a back seat to the things that we're working so hard for. You know, well, I can't serve him right now because, you know, I'm trying to, you know, fill in the blank. I'm trying to get a degree. I'm trying to get a promotion. I'm trying to build a family. I'm trying to get a job. I'm tr- and it just never ends, right? It just continues on. You know, and not that these things are necessarily bad or wrong in and of themselves, but the need is for us to keep Jesus and eternity in the center. That as we go through these things, as we live in this world, that we make sure that we are not of this world. That we make sure that Christ is the center of our job. That, yeah, you know what, we, we, you know, I don't know about that promotion because it's really going to hinder me in my relationship with the Lord here in this area. You know, I, I, I don't know about that job because it's really going to pull me away from what the Lord was doing over here. You know, to be honest with you, that's something my parents always taught us was, hey, you know, when we were 15, 16 years old and we were filling out job applications, they told us it was kind of a a rule. You write down that you cannot work on Sundays or Wednesdays. And uh, from what I know, you know, pretty much all of us did that. And none of us, you know, ever went without a job. You know, none of us ever went hungry. You know, we we were always taken care of. We were always provided for. And though maybe we didn't get one job or a certain job, there was always a job right around the corner that the Lord, you know, gave to us. But it it was always something that was just instilled in us. And I think it's true in all things that as we keep the Lord the center, that he will continue to just bless us. He said, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. And Paul wasn't really talking about tangible things. If you go back in verses four through six, he's really uh, actually talking about you know, the works that got in the way of his relationship with the Lord. You know, it's, life is so weird that working for the Lord or, uh, or serving God can get in the way of serving God. You know, does that make sense? It's just, it's so weird that that's actually a thing, that that can actually happen. And that's what Paul's saying, that in all of my works, and all of my striving and persecuting the church and learning the law and trying to be perfect, and all that I gained, really who lost was Christ. Whatever I gain or whatever I take, Christ has to give up something. Why? Because I could have used that bonus to glorify God, right? I could have used that, you know, that, that hour of arguing to glorify God and to rejoice. I could have used whatever that good thing is, that gift that God has given me that I would have used for myself. I could have used it for the Lord. And Paul in his former life was talking about the glory, the attention that he brought upon himself, that glory that he wanted when in reality he was stealing it from God. Verse eight, read with me. It says, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So whatever he gave up, he did so for the Lord, he says. Let me read it again. It says, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness. Underline that, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means 
I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So what things I have gained is actually a loss and what things I have lost is actually a gain. It's kind of neat how that works, right? What things I have gained is a loss because Christ is losing out. And when Christ loses out, we all lose out, right? We lose out eternally. But yet what things I have lost, what things I have given up, I'm actually gaining, right? I'm actually going to receive tenfold in the end, in eternity. And that's the awesome thing about the Lord. We can never outgive him. We can never give up so much that, that man, Lord, I got you on this one. You owe me now. You know, it's, it's, he's never going to owe us, right? We get to heaven and everything that we've given up in this life is going to be returned and even more so. And that's the awesome thing. I love the, the word that Paul uses here. Paul says, whatever I've given up, he says, is actually rubbish. He uses that word rubbish, right? If you have the New King James Version in your Bible, he uses that word rubbish. I like that. It just reminds me of like an old English, you know, type of word. That's rubbish. In the Webster's Dictionary, he says, rubbish is just waste. It's complete waste. Material that is unimportant or valueless. And when we consider the material things of this world compared to Christ and eternity, it all just seems like rubbish, doesn't it? It all just seems so unimportant, so valueless, so useless, so cheap. And yet so many times we grab onto, we hold onto it. Like if we were to lose it, we, were to, we would lose everything. And yet we give up a lot of times the thing that is so valuable in the Lord. You know, imagine if we walked into one of those speedy cash places, right? And you just said, hey, all I have here is some waste, some trash. You know, I got my old junk. I was going to throw it out. Would you guys, can I trade it in for some money? You know, can I get some money for all this? You know, and really that's what we're doing with the Lord, right? We're trading in our old junk. God says, just bring it all to me. Bring all your waste. Give it all up. Bring it here, drop it off. And what I'm going to give you is so much more valuable. The return that you're going to get is, is so much more awesome. We're just trading it into the Lord. Here's my waste, Lord. Here's my spare time that I would have just wasted away during the day. I'm going to pick up your word and read it. I'm going to go out and, and just do something for you. I'm going to be, a, you know, start, uh, have some sort of ministry within my life. Here's my pride, Lord, that would just destroy my relationships, right? Here's that pride that would just get me into arguments with my family and destroy the friendships that I have. Here it is, God. Let me just give it to you. Here's my spare change that I would have just spent on junk that I don't need. And in return, he gives us salvation. He restores our life. He makes us righteous. Verse 9 Paul says to the Philippians, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, right? Our own righteousness, which comes from the law. But he says, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith. Romans 4, 3 says, for what does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted to Abraham for righteousness, his belief in God. Do you know that Abraham was a wicked man? If you read the story of Abraham right now, I'm in Genesis and my devotionals kind of just starting over here in January. And Abraham, man, you read the story of Abraham, you're just like, really, this guy, Lord? This is the guy you want to pick? Are you kidding me? Like there, there wasn't anyone better out there? Like Noah, you could understand, right? Like Noah was a righteous man and, you know, really good guy and stuff. But then he chose Abraham and it's like, What? You know, Abraham, the first chance that he had to cheat on his wife, took it. Sarah, Abraham, go, why don't you go and, and, and sleep with my maidservant because we can't have children? You know, Abraham doesn't even argue with her a little bit. He doesn't even act like he's against the idea, you know, like, hello? Just, yeah, you know, Sarah, that's a great idea. Wicked. 
Abraham was a liar when he went into Egypt, right? You remember? Sarah, say you're my, my sister so they won't, won't kill me and, and, and take you. Great faith, Abraham. But it says that when God came to Abraham and when he expressed his desire for Abraham, it's really neat because there in Genesis, God even kind of just ponders to himself and he says, should I keep what I'm doing from him? And you can just kind of see him go, no, I'm gonna let him know. And he tells Abraham all that he wants to do. Your descendants will be greater than the stars in the sky. You know what it says? It says, Abraham believed. He believed. And from that moment, it was accounted to him for righteousness. In all of his wickedness, in all of his unfaithfulness to the Lord, because he believed he was made righteous. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Verse 12 says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that, which it, uh, f- of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The ESV version says this for, that, for verses 12 through 14. Let me read it to you. Just kind of gives you a different perspective and hopefully allows you to get a better understanding. It says this, starting with verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, it just goes back really to Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Are we perfect yet? Far from it. Have we obtained yet that perfection? That righteous, was Abraham now from that moment on sinless? Far from it. Paul says, hey, I haven't obtained it yet. I haven't received it yet, but he's walking as though he had. And really he, you know, kind of sort of in a way, you know, he kind of had. Why? Because, you know, the work that needed to be done for that perfection was already done, right? It was already completed. He was just waiting to obtain the prize. The war has already been won. Christ already rose from the dead. He already conquered death on the cross. So really we are, we we already, you know, have that promise of perfection though we are still, you know, waiting for it. It's kind of like, it just made me think like, kind of like you order something off of Amazon, right? You guys use Amazon in here? Some of you guys use Amazon? We had like a million boxes delivered to our house over this last month, right? I think my wife got everybody's gift, Christmas gift off of Amazon or the new website, Zulili, whatever it's called. And we have like a million boxes in our garage, right? So if you need boxes, let me know and I can get you some. But it just kind of reminded me of that, right? Like you order something off of Amazon and you kind of own it already, right? It's your, I mean, you paid for it. They already pulled the money out of your account, you know, right away. It's just in transit. It's just waiting to get to your door. You know, you're just waiting to receive it. And it's kind of neat because that's kind of what, what's going on right now already. You know, it's, it's already been ordered. It's already been sent out. It's, it's, you know, you can even almost track it. You know, let me just track this and kind of see where it's at. You know, and before we know it, that, that, that gift is going to arrive at the door. Verse 14, he says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We just continue to press forward. We continue to press on for that prize. No one said it would be easy. No one said it would always be fun. But we continue to press on because no matter how well you run the race, if you stop halfway through, you still lost the race, right? 
Paul says, continue to press on, Philippians. Continue to run. You know, I love the, kind of the analogy or the thought that Pastor Chuck kind of gave a few times. He kind of gave this thought of, you know, life being more so like a parade to the Lord. I don't know if you guys watched the New Year's Day Parade. Uh, It was something that was kind of tradition in our house growing up. So, you know, even still today, if we don't have it on, I feel kind of weird. So on New Year's Day, we always have to turn it on and put it on the TV and all that. And though we're, you know, maybe not even watching it, just to kind of have it on, you know, just kind of, you know, just kind of nostalgic type of thing. But, um, you know, Chuck kind of always give that analogy with God, that he's kind of just sitting back and he's just watching life as a parade. You know, we're there in the stands We're there in the parade and we can't see the front from the back. We can't see the beginning from the end. We can't really see what's going on. All we can see is what we can physically see, right? From our perspective, from our seat. But he said, God sits back and God gets to see the whole thing in completion from beginning to end. And for him, it's like, it's done. Before we know it, the blink of an eye, we're there that prize, that gift, it's already been won, it's already been given. And we're just waiting for the parade to be over. Verse 15, it says, therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So Paul's really just encouraging the Philippians here that if they are a believer, and really he says mature believer, right? If they're mature, and that's something that we should be striving for is to be not just believers, but to be mature believers, to read our word, to study our word, to fall in love with the word of God. He says that if you're a mature believer in Jesus Christ, then you must have and you must teach this mindset. What mindset is that? The mindset that Jesus paid it all. The mindset that we are to what? The first thing that we underlined in our Bible, in the chapter, that we are to rejoice in the Lord. How important that is to rejoice in the Lord. Know it, believers. Know it, Philippians, that you are to rejoice in the Lord. The Lord. And finally, in closing, verse 17 says, Brethren, join us or join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven. Underline that. For our citizenship is in heaven, from uh, which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to him self. Again, if that's not a prize, I do not know what is. What an awesome promise that one day our lowly body will be conformed to his glorious body. He says, be careful of dogs. Be careful of those walking around that, are, that only have their interests in heart that are always walking around saying, I, 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 I will, I want. They know it all, I, I, I. Paul says that in the end, it will be nothing but destruction for them. But he says, but you Christian, but you Christian, but you believer, verse 20, for your citizenship is in heaven from which you also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly wait, Paul says. It's almost like an oxymoron, right? Kind of, sort of. Eagerly wait. Like, how do you eagerly wait? That's like the hardest, that's like so difficult, right? Wait, but do it eagerly. Like, 
What do you want me to do, Paul? You want me to wait? Or you want me to just eagerly, you know, you know just go out and get it? It's a hard place to be. You know, definitely easier said than done. Are you, are you eagerly waiting for the Savior? Can you say that in your life? Are you eagerly waiting for the Lord to return? Are you eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back and catch up his church, to redeem his church? Or are you just waiting to die? I got till 70, 80, 90. Paul says, no, don't just wait, eagerly wait, right? Eagerly waiting causes us to be in an interesting place. You can't be eager for his return without waiting because then you end up becoming impatient, right? You end up wanting to force things. You end up wanting things to happen now. And yet you can't wait for his return without being eager. Because then you end up forgetting that he's even going to return. You just keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And then eventually you're like, what was I waiting for? I was waiting for something. You know, you ever do that? You just, you know, let me go in the room and just get that one. And you walk in and you're like, why did I come in here? (laughs) It's kind of like that. Paul says, eagerly wait. Patience for his perfect timing, but anticipating that great day. Not holding too tight to this world. Every decision that we make, holding on to his return. Amen? Let's pray. Father, that's our prayer this evening, Lord, that you would allow us, that you would give us that ability, God, that gift to just eagerly wait for you, Lord. We, that is something truly, Father, that we cannot do without your help, Lord. God, so many times we feel like we're just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and we feel like the waiting never ends. But Lord, we ask that we would constantly have your return, that prize that you have for us, Lord, that glorious body, that that would always be right there in the forefront of our minds, Lord. That as we wait, God, as we are patient, Father, for your return, that we would not stop anticipating it. And Lord, in doing so, that we truly, Father, would not hold too tight to this world. All the material things, even our relationships, Father, even our loved ones, that we would just know that they are yours. And that we would know, Father, that no matter what happens, one day we will see them again in heaven. And that one day all things will be made new. But for now, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to rejoice, God, in all things that you have for us. You're so good. You're so amazing. You are the Alpha and the Omega, Lord, the beginning and the end. You desire great things for us, God. And we just ask that you would help us to rejoice in them. And we just pray this in your name this evening. Amen. Amen.